Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. Um, I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today I'm with Mike Newman, and we're going to be discussing the building design and construction systems mock exam um, that we issued yesterday. Um, I suppose, as Mike and I have been talking here today, you know, sort of the special thing about this particular exam is BDCNS, you sort of come across lots of things that seem to be related to things, right? Materials and things like that. So but, concrete and steel and wood and all that. Right, and I think um, the focus here, and Mike is gonna kind of help focus on how uh, this exam is really actually ultimately more about design and sort of the, uh, how you um, take those things and um, use them through the language of design, I suppose. Um, so, but before we get started, um, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, um, we're very interestingly, uh, we're going to be focusing on something entirely different. So as you guys know, the new uh, exam is coming out on November 1st, uh, in 2016. Um, and so for August, we're going to focus on um, the exam called Project Planning and Design. So that's for ARE 5.0. Um, and the reason we're going to focus on that specific exam is because as some of you know, um, there is what we call the ARE 4 to 5 transition where you can take some exams in ARE 4.0 and some exams in ARE 5.0 and you actually end up taking fewer exams in order to complete the ARE. Um, so this exam, Project Planning and Design, is actually one of those exams from ARE 5.0 that you can take um, and that can help you sort of finish this whole thing faster. So we're going to do, very likely, we're going to do um, something like uh, we're going to focus on uh, a case study which might incorporate some of the new question types. So it should be a really good session um, for our next one. Uh, and so if you want to register for that, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. Um, and just like this one, during the broadcast, you'll have a chance to ask questions to the group as well as to Mike. Um, now, if you don't know Mike, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also a founder of Shed Studio, and he's the instructor for Black Spectacles Online ARE exam prep curriculum. Um, if you haven't already checked out our ARE exam prep curriculum, you can head over to blackspectacles.com where you can watch all sorts of free tutorials from all the different courses. Um, and today, um, we have a couple of special things we're doing. So number one, at the end, we have a special Black Spectacles promo code to share. Um, secondly, at the end of today's episode, um, we will be choosing someone from all the folks who submitted their answers to the mock exam, and they'll win a free one-month ARE plus software learning uh, Black Spectacles membership. And uh, finally, we'll be tracking everybody's answers, and everyone who actually gets all of the questions right will send you a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. So stay tuned for all that stuff. And tonight, uh, we'll be taking questions using the GoToWebinar question box, as well as on Twitter using the ARE Live podcast hashtag. So hashtag ARE Live podcast. Um, we'll be checking that out. We'll also be taking questions through the uh, GoToWebinar question box. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to Mr. Newman. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, so as Mark said, as we get into the next round, we're going to be starting to talk about uh, the ARE 5.0 and uh, some of the meanings for that. But uh, while we're here, you still got plenty of time to do this in 4.0. And that's what we're talking about tonight with the building design and construction systems. So uh, no reason to wait. Uh, might as well just uh, dive right in and, and start going along. Uh, OK. So what we've done here is just done sort of quick, simple little uh, questions uh, to try to just kind of pique our interest in, in how you might start thinking about these things and why we're asking certain kinds of questions. And um, these are sort of probably a little simpler uh, than the, the real questions, but kind of gets you into the sort of ballpark uh, as a way of kind of thinking about it. So let's just dive in and uh, start with the first one. So number one, a um, small commercial building is to have a stair built between three different levels, including at zero feet, which is at grade, to 13.6 at the second floor, uh, to then the top floor at 27 feet, six and three quarters inches. Uh, what can you say about the stair? And we have a couple of different uh, possible answers uh, down below. First of all, let's take a look at the numbers. Uh, answer number A is, says something about six and three quarter inches, 6.75 inches. Uh, answer B talks about a 7-inch riser with an 11-inch tread. 
Uh, answer C uh, has a six and three quarter for one and then a six and a half for the second. And answer D has a six and three quarters. So there's not that many options. We know we're kind of uh, in that uh, six and a half to seven inch range. Those are all the different possibilities, which sounds about right. Um, so first thing we're gonna do, uh, and this is probably something that's pretty obvious to, to most people, but you'd be surprised um, that it actually throws people off uh, all the time when I'm talking to them about it. So we're just gonna do it super fast and we're gonna think about uh, the first floor uh, to the second floor um, and just kind of run through that. So we have a 13.6 uh, is our uh, floor to floor range. And so when we think about that, uh, 13 is going to be 156, so plus 6 is that's going to be 162 inches. So we have 162 inches uh, floor to floor. So we immediately take 162 and we divide it by 7. Why 7? Because this is a commercial building. If it was a residential single family, that would, might be a different question. We might be able to do it 7.5 or even 8, sometimes even a little more than that. But for a commercial building, a typical standard uh, accessible stair, uh, seven inch riser is the maximum. So a seven eleven stair is an accessible stair. Seven inch riser, 11 inch tread. And so we're just gonna start with seven because we wanna assume that, that we're somewhere right uh, near there. Uh, so we divide 162 by seven and we get 23.14. Uh, so that means uh, if we had seven inch risers for this 162 inch floor to floor, we would have 23.14 risers. Well, clearly having a 0.14 risers, we've got a little bit of a problem there. That's not going to be reasonable. Uh, that's going to be a trip hazard. It doesn't make any sense. So we're going to round it to an even number. So, all right, let's say we say 162, then we're going to divide it by 23. 20, so we're dividing it by 23 risers. When we figure that out, we're going to end up with 7.043, I think, uh, inches. So very close to 7 inches. Uh, but not close enough. Uh, it's over, and so, well, that means we rounded the wrong way. Uh, we can't round down, because that means we're gonna be higher than seven inch. Seven inch is the maximum for an accessible stair, so it means we have to have rounded up. So I'm gonna go back, 162, divide by 24, and that's gonna give us 6.75 inches. So that means our riser from the first floor to the second floor is six and three quarter inches, uh, 6.75. Um, and then if we kind of do this whole calculation again, we'll realize that from the uh, second floor to the third floor is actually gonna be 25 risers, uh, also at 6.75. Uh, so uh, first thing we realize is B, is not a possible answer because B is talking about a seven inch riser. Uh, we look at A, well, A seems possible because it's talking about a six and three quarter inch riser. Uh, C is not possible because of that 6.5. So the C is not possible. D, a switchback stair with a 6.75, that is possible. So the question now is A and D are both possible answers which is the one that's most likely to be uh, the case. Uh, and so let's read them a little more closely. A straight run stair with a six and uh, three quarter inch riser uh, without any landing. That seems like an odd statement. Uh, so it's kind of jumping out at me. Something seems peculiar there. This one talks about a switchback stair. So a switchback stair is just anytime you have that stair, uh, that sort of classic uh, stair plan uh, where I have steps on either side. Uh, you walk up the steps, I get to a landing. I walk up the next set of steps, I get to a landing. That's called a switchback stair. Uh, and so this one's just saying, okay, it's a typical stair with that. So that seems like a pretty good potential answer, but what's going on with A? What's the thing without any landing? Well, the little trick here is that uh, from a code standpoint, a straight run stair Without any landing, the maximum I can run is 12 feet vertically. This is a 13.6 vertical run, so therefore uh, it would not meet code to not have a landing in that space. Uh, why is that? Um, well, all you young, fresh folks out there think, well, who cares? 13.6 doesn't seem like that big a deal. 
Uh, wait till you're 60, wait till you're 70, wait till you're 80, trying to get up those stairs. You need a place to rest. Uh, and so there's this mandatory uh, idea that you're gonna have a, a, a riser height less than seven or seven or less. Uh, and you also have to give people a chance to be able to get a breather. So uh, that's what's going on. The answer is D. Uh, now, there aren't that many direct code related issues that um, would be that specifically, uh, that, that you would need to know that specifically uh, for, for an exam like this. But there are a few, like 7-Eleven, uh, like this, like a 1 in 12 for ADA ramp. There's probably, you know, I don't know, 10 or 20 or 30 of these um, that you really should just know because they're expected uh, throughout the uh, IBC that pretty much everywhere in the country will be using those same numbers. Uh, so hopefully that made sense. Um, the, the trick is you start with the seven inch. Uh, if it divides evenly, then that's great. It's probably not going to. So then you have to round up. Now you know the number of risers and then you can go and you get it all figured out. Shall we move on? Yeah, I think you're taking that one about uh, being 60 a little personally. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not 60. Hey, give, give me a break. Uh, all right. Um, but I still get really tired on stairs. So there you go. That's why I feel that answer so keenly. All right, number two. Uh, what is the height of the guardrail at the stair landing referenced in the previous question? So this one's a pretty s straightforward uh, issue as well. Uh, when we're talking about, you know, something like a guardrail, um, we're talking about there's somebody standing in the space. Uh, they're, uh, while they're standing, they're standing on the edge of something. This is maybe a big drop, and we're worried that they're just going to fall right off. So we need to give them some way that they're not going to fall off, and we put a guardrail there. Uh, that guardrail, in terms of... Uh, the IBC, the International Building Code, is going to be 42 inches. So 42 inches above the finished floor. So the answer for this one is going to be a write-in, and you're going to say 42 inches, or 3 foot 6. Uh, now, in certain jurisdictions, that would actually be 36 inches. I don't, I've never seen one that was any different, it was a different number than either 36 or 42. It's, uh, guardrails, I think, are always either 36 or 42. Um, but the 36s are essentially being sort of weeded out over the years um, and uh, will probably be gone in a relatively short order. 42 is much, much more um, uh, typical, and IBC, uh, which is what the uh, exam is based on, is always going to be using that IBC. So let's think about a couple of other issues while we're talking about it. So this is for a guardrail. What if this had said handrail, right? If that had said handrail instead of guardrail, this would be a very different question. So what we'd be talking about there, oops, not quite flat there. All right, so I've got a stair. I'm gonna go from the nosing straight up and I'm going to go up uh, either two foot nine or two foot ten. Uh, there's a little bit of wiggle room in there um, because there's lots of different situations and different stairs and different types of populations. Uh, so that's either um, uh, 33 or 34 inches, two foot nine or two foot ten. Uh, and then I'm going to use that as my height. That's going to be would be the height of the handrail. So the guardrail just like the word, uh, it's guarding you from, from falling off. The handrail is something you're supposed to touch. It's something that you need to get up and down the stair. Uh, so that guardrail is gonna be at 33 inches or 34 inches. Um, so we can immediately sort of see what's happening there. Uh, while we're kind of looking at it, you may notice that I drew uh, these uh, steps uh, you kind of rise, run in sort of an odd way. Um, I'm going to sort of zoom in a little bit here. Uh, you know, kind of the classic uh, residential system might be a uh, riser that looks something like that, a uh, tread that goes flat across, another one that comes up, a little nosing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what I was drawing there was one that angles 
and then flattens out, and then angles, and then flattens out. Those are supposed to be the same angle. Uh, and why was I drawing it like this and not with the nosing? Because of commercial stair these days, if you imagine somebody walking up that, that stair, um, let's see, there's my boot um, with a very thin, uh, thin leg coming out of it. Uh, and this person is catching their toe on that nosing. So as you're going up the stairs and each one of those uh, uh, steps, there's a potential for a little trip hazard there. If I have this angle, then there's nothing there to stop uh, the boot, so the boot will just slide right up and over and get to the step as, a, as appropriate. So uh, one of the things you'll see for a commercial stair, you probably should not ever see that nosing anymore. You used to see them, but you probably really shouldn't see them anymore. Uh, another thing you might sort of be curious about is what happens with uh, uh, these uh, railings as they get down to the end. Um, when I get to the landing at the end, uh, for one, they don't stop right at the base of the step. They actually will continue past. Uh, there's a couple of different situations, uh, so I won't get too deep into it, but typically it's about 12 inches. Uh, sometimes it's a right, uh, it's, excuse me, it's a tread plus 12, um, but it's gonna go at least that far, uh, 12 inches. And if you think about like, well, why is that? It seems weird that you would force the handrail to go past the edge of the steps. But the answer to that is, again, if uh, you're having a little trouble getting up and down the stairs, it's really handy to get sort of settled holding on to that handrail before you actually start making your way up the stairs. So you get a chance, you're still on the landing, I can grab onto it, and now I can start moving up and use that handrail to help me get up uh, to the top. A uh, couple other sort of little quick issues while we're talking about stairs. So that's our uh, switchback stair. Uh, where is that handrail? Is it in the uh, inside of the run or is it on the outside of the run? So is this the handrail? Well, yeah, I need it to be on the inside, but I also need it to be on the outside. So I'm gonna see handrails on both sides uh, of, of that so that either way, whichever hand is a good hand for somebody who's going up and down, they can use that handrail to, to uh, help themselves get up and down. Does that outside one have to wrap all the way around? Uh, no, it doesn't, though you can. Um, it just needs to have that extension pass that we just talked about. Uh, if this is where my door is uh, and this is the travel path of somebody on that landing. And I think, well, wouldn't it be great to give them more space? Like why just give them only the space they need? Maybe I should make this landing even bigger so it's even safer? What do you think about that? Well, the downside with that is I know what I would do if I was the building owner. I would fill that with I don't know, boxes of paper and paint and things like that because there'd be this excess space that would could be really great for storage. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do in that stairwell. So code officials actually don't want you to do that. They want you to keep it nice and like right exactly at what's expected. Uh, so the travel path is uh, clear. There's a little bit of extra room past that and that's it. Because uh, if you start having extra room, people will fill that space with something. Suddenly you'll have furniture and all kinds of things there. And then up at the uh, landing level where the door is, I have the travel path again, and then I've got a little extra space there. What's that about? Well, clearly that's where the area of refuge is gonna go. So that area of refuge and this door swing are outside of the travel path. Now, typically there's a little bit of overlap that's allowed, uh, but it would uh, tell you about uh, how much of an overlap because that's a little different from uh, municipality to municipality. So a couple of very simple uh, sets of uh, numbers, but uh, all of these things you should feel very, very comfortable with uh, in order to uh, start thinking about taking this exam because it will absolutely show up in a couple of different places. We do have one question here. Uh, John asks, is it really 33 or is it actually 34? He had always thought that it was 34 to 38 inches. Um, uh, 33, 34 is the typical for a handrail. Um, though some situations will allow you to go up a little bit higher. Uh, the, you know, that's an interesting question for IBC. I always use 34. Um, 
Uh, and I, actually, it's a good question. I should really check that out because I'm uh, I may be using an older number uh, just from my old days. But like I say, I always use 34, uh, which is two foot ten. Uh, 38 is actually really high for most people and actually quite difficult for most people. So as a general number, that's just not a very good number. There are certain situations where uh, the codes allow for uh, a higher height like that, um, but it's not, it, uh, in general, it's not a very nice height to, to work with, for, especially for an older person. Cool. So good question. Uh, Rachel notes that California code is a minimum of 34 to 38, so it may be regional. Right? Yeah, maybe, maybe a little regional. 34 is definitely the sort of go-to number that I would take away from that. All right. Number three, the span is going to be 160 foot for the gymnasium. The engineer has suggested a few options. Which of the following rings true? The trouble, A, the trouble with uh, precast concrete will be transportation logistics for such a long span. B, open web steel joists will give the strongest and stiffest long span structure. C, glue lamb wood systems would clearly be the most economical. D, the advantage of post tension concrete is very low formwork costs. So this is talking about a bunch of different possibilities for doing a long span, uh, 160 foot long uh, clear span element. And uh, each one is it's claiming a, a certain aspect uh, of uh, either strength or difficulty with uh, a different type of uh, system for the long span. Uh, are there any that we can very quickly uh, get, get off, the, off the plan here? Well, one that jumps out to me, maybe, uh, this may not be something you've dealt with very much, so I don't know if it's something that has come up for most of you, but uh, glue lamb systems uh, are just not uh, easily economical. Um, they tend to be very specialized uh, and they're beautiful. I'm a huge fan of uh, glue lamb systems, but they're definitely not the most economical way of dealing with something uh, of this kind of span. Uh, that's a pretty long span for glue lamb, although doable. Um, and it would uh, be a lot of effort to, to make, a, make something like that work. So I'm gonna just say, all right, glue lambs, that's just not economical, that's not a reasonable answer. Uh, and then let's look at a couple of the other ones. How about open web steel joists? Uh, well, open web steel joists are absolutely economical for uh, that kind of span. It'd be a pretty deep uh, steel joist, but, uh, but they, could, they could handle it with the, the deep uh, um, open web. Uh, so that's a very economical choice. However, it's not going to be the stiffest choice, and that's what it's saying there. Um, I remember years ago, uh, the sort of mid late 90s, when the first IKEA opened in our area and uh, happened to be there on opening weekend, and it was packed. It was filled with people. Everybody was like really excited to have the first IKEA in the, in the region. And uh, it's literally filled with people. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be at the Great Ikea disaster of 1997 or whatever year it was. Uh, uh, it was. The floor was bouncing so much from so many people walking on it. And that was because it was just overloaded and they're perfectly strong. They're just not stiff, those open web steel joists. And so they just you know, shouldn't have that many people on it because it just was crazy. So uh, B, yeah, not a reasonable answer because uh, stiffness is not the, uh, the big uh, uh, winning thing for the open web steel joists. Economical, lightweight, uh, you can run uh, ductwork through them. There's a bunch of advantages to them, but stiffness uh, is not it. So then that leaves us with A and D. Uh, let's see what D says. Uh, the advantage of post-tension concrete is uh, very low formwork costs. So what is post-tension concrete? Well, post-tension concrete is when you effectively build a formwork system that spans the entire distance uh, for this long span, uh, and then you lay in some uh, uh, post-tensioning uh, cables, and then you pour concrete into that formwork, and then once it's started to set, you uh, use hydraulic jacks and pull on those cables uh, and it's a very, very strong system. Uh, so that great big long uh, system that I've got uh, these cables running all the way through. I've got the jacks on either end. I can make these cables very, very uh, uh, high tension. That's gonna give this whole thing a little bit of camber. So it's gonna reach up now. And that's gonna be very, very strong uh, structure. 
however, that is not going to have low formwork costs. That's a lot of formwork for uh, that one beam. Uh, so D, not it. So that leaves us with A. The trouble with precast concrete will be transportation logistics for such a long span. So imagine you've got a place where you're making the precast uh, structures that are going to span this distance, and I've got 160 foot long precast elements. How are those going to get to the site? Uh, maybe through a helicopter? Uh, but like the longest trucks you can get are probably about 80, 90 feet. Uh, so we're a good 60, 70 feet longer than the longest regular trucks. Uh, you can get specialty transportation uh, and figure out some way to do it in the middle of the night or something. Uh, maybe you can kind of easily go up to 120, 130, 140. Uh, but you, these are very, very big elements. And, you know, imagine you're trying to get that through a city street or something. Uh, so long span with uh, a precast, that's always going to be the issue. Uh, one of the reasons that precast is often used uh, for uh, reasonably long span for um, parking garages, because the parking garage spans tend to be about 60 to 80 feet, uh, kind of roughly in that range. Well, 80 feet, that'll fit on the back of a truck, a long truck, but it'll fit on the back of a truck. Uh, as soon as I start getting up into that 100, 120, 160, that becomes a really big problem. Uh, so what's being asked here is just that you have some fairly basic ideas of the process, the economy, the, the sort of desires, like what, what, are, what are the benefits and what are the uh, negatives that I get out of each of these different uh, systems. Wow, that was a, that was a tricky one. We, got, uh, <clears throat> we had about 120-some people answer questions, and you knocked about 90 of them out with that one. <laughs> well, good job on the, um, on the guys that got in there. Kyle, uh, I should say, Kyle asked an interesting question. He says, in the post-tension beam, do they lay the tension rod flat or with an inverse arc to the camber? They usually, it's a, so there's two things. There's a, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. But um, the sort of classic one is that it's actually more like a tendon. So it's like a cable, sort of a thick cable. And so it would have an arc in it, um, a, a sort of parabolic, catenary, whatever, arc. Um, and then when they pull the cable, that tendon, it, it goes towards flat. And that's what lifts up the camber. Um, but it doesn't have to be that. It can actually be uh, uh, reinforcing, actual reinforcing bars. Uh, so they're solid bars, and they just still get pulled, um, and then it's what's happening there is you're not really doing, um, it's, it's not changing the shape as much in that same way. It's more that you're putting the concrete directly into compression. Both, the whole point on both of them is to put the concrete into compression, but uh, with a solid bar, it's more about putting it into compression. With the tendons, it's more about changing the shape uh, into that camber. Okay. Good question. All right. Okay. This is kind of a silly question. Just gives us a chance to talk about uh, a couple different issues. Uh, the beam is placed. Uh, the, beam, the beam to be placed in the historic rehab is a 20-foot long W16 by 50. If each worker can carry 100 pounds, how many workers would it take to carefully move it into place? So there's a couple of things that you need to know. Um, if I have a uh, W16 by 50, uh, the 16 is the nominal height. So it's not the actual height, it's not exactly 16 inches, but it's fairly close to 16 inches, so it's the nominal height. And then the 50 is the uh, pounds per linear foot. Uh, and from the exam standpoint, uh, almost always when we're talking about pounds, uh, what we're really talking about is dollars. Uh, that if I have a beam that can work as a W16 by 50, uh, but then I find another beam that also still meets all the uh, loading capacities that I need, and it's a uh, W16 by 48, or it's a, even a W18 by 48, um, it would be lower pounds per linear foot, and we buy steel by the pound, and so therefore it's lower money. 
So almost always when we talk about that last number there, we're actually talking about money. In this case, we're not talking about money. We're just talking about how heavy the thing is. Uh, so I've got a 20 foot one, it's 50 pounds per linear foot. Uh, so clearly that's uh, 100 pounds uh, times 10, so that's 1,000 uh, pounds. We got uh, 100 pounds per person, so that's gonna take 10 workers to move. Uh, so the answer to that is gonna be 10. Um, and uh, as you start thinking this thing through, you uh, sort of clearly realize, well, 10 workers carrying a, a, a 20 foot long beam, that's a little complicated, that's a, that's a lot of people. Um, but this is actually the kind of thing that has to be thought through when you're talking about adaptive reuse or historic rehabs, where I can't always uh, get um, uh, the cranes in place, or I can't always, uh, uh, you know, use the the sort of typical ways that you would be carrying these things around. Uh, I've got to maybe get something through a window and then up the stairs and then go through. Uh, I actually just had a situation like this where we had to. Uh, calculate exactly how, uh, uh, whether we could get uh, the beam that we wanted uh, on the diagonal up through the stair and into the place. Um, and it's a, a very um, embarrassing and horrible thing when you haven't done that and they're standing there <laughs> with the beam and there's no way for it to get there and everybody's looking at you. Um, it's not always your job, it may be the contractor's job, but it would be a conversation between the two of you uh, and trying to figure out what's the sort of most reasonable way to answer the issues uh, um, at, in, at hand. A um, couple of kind of uh, uh, sort of quick uh, issues here. If I have that wide flange, that W shape, that's a little thin there for the flange, but so I got the two flanges and then the web in between. Um, the way these things are made, right, is that I have a series of uh, of rollers that I start with a chunk of steel and it goes through a first roller and it kind of gets sort of roughly shaped and then it gets uh, with another roller when these things are really hot and uh, all right now it's getting kind of close uh, and it, you know so it's going through hundreds of these rollers and it gets closer and closer and closer and eventually I get it to the shape I want right so this uh, shape uh, is that very efficient, uh, really all the extras are, have been taken out. And the reason I mention this is uh, that let's say instead of it being a W16 by 50, 50 is, for 16 is relatively light, it's not a super heavy uh, beam. Uh, let's say instead of that it was 110, so it was W16 by 110. Well then almost all of that weight would be added up on top here and down on the bottom because it's the same set of rollers that are creating that, that steel. Now, at some point, they'll go to a new set of rollers, and so there's a couple of breaking points. But the reason I mention this is, uh, when it's the W16 by 50, that uh, 16 nominal dimension is probably pretty darn close to the actual dimension. But at the 16 by 110, that's a much chunkier piece of steel, so that's actually gonna be significantly taller it's still a nominal 16, but the actual dimension would be much uh, deeper. It'd be maybe a full inch deeper or something like that. So you might be up to 17 inch or 17 and a half inch. I haven't looked it up, so I'm not sure. But, um, but you get the idea that that's how that nominal dimension works. So it's kind of useful. If you can kind of keep that in your head, you have a pretty good idea of where those chunky uh, bits are gonna go. Uh, eventually, the, uh, once you start getting heavier and heavier, that web will start getting larger as well. Okay. Not too many victims with that one. Yeah, that's, that was a pretty easy one. Uh, a good one to feel comfortable with. All right, uh, number five. Which of the following is a row lock? Um, so this is a bunch of bricks. Um, and... Uh, the first one we have here, uh, if the, that's the face that's showing uh, when it's sitting in the wall, um, that there's a couple different names for this position, um, but that would be, I, we always called it a runner. Um, I, th I think there's a few other names for it. Um, uh, and then this tall one uh, is actually kind of an unusual uh, one, It's because it's not probably what you're uh, thinking. Um, so. 
most people would probably assume that that's uh, referred to as a soldier. Uh, here's a little bit of ridiculous, useless information for you. Um, if I have a uh, bunch of soldiers all lined up uh, and they're standing at attention, their feet are together. There's their guns. I don't know. Does that, that make sense? Their feet are all standing together uh, as they're lined up. So uh, that's representing the short face. If the short face was the one that was uh, being shown, that would be called a soldier course. Uh, if we were talking about this face, that's the wide face being shown, that would be called a sailor course. And the reason for that is if you imagine a ship coming in and they're all wearing their navy whites, uh, if you stand like a soldier, you're going to fall over because the boat's moving around. So the navy folks, when they're at attention, stand with a wide stance. And so that's why if it's this one with this face here, uh, then that would be called a sailor course. So um, uh, neither of those happen to be rowlock. It's not a runner, it's not a sailor, it's not a soldier. Um, and this last one here is referred to as a header um, when that face is what's shown. Um, so that only leaves C left. C is when it's uh, the short uh, but vertically um, placed but vertically in only the short direction, that's a row lock. Uh, all right, so what are the issues here? Well, one issue is when you are uh, putting these things in a kiln, I've got them all lined up. Uh, I have them stacked. Uh, and when, I, when these things, there's you know, a couple thousand of these things stacked together and they're in that kiln, uh, these faces are the ones that are getting the nice uh, heat uh, that's uh, really making those uh, weather resistant, uh, at least sort of weather resistant. Bricks are notoriously porous, but um, you know, kind of weather resistant. Uh, the faces that are not getting uh, uh, the same level of, uh, of uh, um, moisture resistance are going to be these uh, long flat faces. So they tend to be much more porous. Uh, so the sailor course doesn't get used very much because you have the wrong face showing. Um, and, uh, you know, the, these thin faces are the ones that almost always uh, are the ones that you're shooting for, for, for showing. Well, that still works with that row lock. Um, that's still the elements that can be um, uh, expressed. Uh, and so that's why it's uh, used. So, okay, where would be a good example of using it? Uh, let's see, how about, here's a window. There's a couple different ways you might, uh, you might use it. Uh, so there's a window sill, there's my inner wall, uh, and then here's a bunch of bricks, sort of regular brick wall. If I put yet another, just another brick right on there, first of all, that brick is likely to be one that has holes in it in order to make it a little bit lighter and to make it uh, 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 harden in the kiln process better. Um, uh, so I want to put something there but not have this face uh, showing. If I just put another brick, it would be the wrong face. So I put that face showing, I stand it up break it off on the edge, I put it on a tilt, and that's a row lock right there with there's those things showing. Uh, and then I have, uh, if this is the rain coming down, so there's my drop of rain, it's going to drip right on that edge. This is going to form a natural drip edge, and it's going to drip away uh, from the building uh, right in that spot. Uh, it's going to give me a slightly different look to sort of emphasize the sill. So that's the place that I would use it, uh, where I'm getting the benefits of the, the right side is being expressed and exposed. Uh, I'm getting the benefits by it becomes an automatic self uh, drip, drip edge element um, and uh, uh, will kind of read both uh, to emphasize the sill, but also still as very clearly part of the uh, brick wall. So it's not doesn't have to be used that way. That's just sort of a kind of typical classic way that it would be done. There's a few other ways for other sort of dramatic uh, 
uh, brick detail when you could use it for. All right, we're gonna move on. That was a lot of brick information. Number six, structural steel commercial building is sited right on the property line. Uh, which of the following is likely not true? Okay, so one thing, I cheated on this one. I did a question that says not true. Um, the actual real exams won't do that anymore. Um, they've uh, recently um, have stopped using ones that are reverse. Um, uh, th it will always be uh, spoken about in a positive, not in a, not a negative way. Um, so, okay, uh, structural steel commercial building sited right on the property line. Which of the following is likely not true? Uh, it would be reasonable to have the exterior columns set back a few feet in order to allow those columns to be placed in the center of their respective footings. B, the exterior column footings can be eccentri eccentrically loaded without difficulty. C, excavation of the exterior column footings is difficult if the building is built to the property line without damaging neighboring properties. D, it is highly likely that there will be a grade beam at the building perimeter. Um, so, uh, which of these is not true? Um, I can tell you right off the bat that B is going to be the answer. The exterior column footings can be ex eccentrically loaded without difficulty. Now, it's totally doable, and we do it all the time, but it's very difficult. So, let's just do a quick little run through of what we're talking about here. So, imagine I have a column and a column and then another column, and another column, and here's the property line. So I got those columns right up against that property line. Well, the footing for these columns wants to be right in the center, make that nice and easy uh, way to uh, load that footing so that uh, you get a very simple, straightforward, um, uh, loading diagram. So there's my footing, there's the column in section, um, and then I have this one. Well, well, clearly if I did the exact same thing, that footing would go across the property line. And one thing we know, that's no good. You cannot, even below grade, put something on somebody else's property. So that's not going to work. So we could do something like, all right, here's the column. Uh, and instead of having it go all the way over there, we're going to make it much bigger and deeper, uh, and we're going to throw tons of rebar in there in order to make that eccentrically loaded uh, and still work. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is we might just connect these two, uh, and so we get a one giant one. Uh, another possibility, which would be A, uh, is that we actually shift this uh, column back a little farther put the regular nice cheap footing down below it, and then with the uh, upper beams just cantilever past. And then we can just hang that structure right out of that property line wherever we want. So any of those are all uh, likely ways to do this, um, but uh, absolutely trying to do this kind of very complicated uh, footing right at that property line is very expensive and, and difficult. Like I said, we do it all the time because people often just don't want to, they're not willing to pay for the space loss of shifting those columns deeper in uh, or just the extra amount of concrete it takes to tie those things together. Um, but uh, it is something that, uh, so it can be done, but it's a, a difficult thing to do. The last one, the grade beam, that's essentially that no matter what's going on, pretty much all of these, if that's the grade line, in between these columns, there's going to be a continuous grade beam uh, out of concrete, probably, um, that will uh, go down to uh, below frost depth uh, and will uh, allow for the exterior wall to sit on it. So it won't be structural for the floors above, but it'll be structural for the, for the wall. Uh, and it also helps stop uh, you know, rodents and, and uh, insects and uh, frost and all of those things. So grade beam uh, very likely would show up uh, on all of them. All right, hopefully that made sense. Yeah, we're down to six. Okay, wow. <laughs> all right, uh, number seven. Um, so this uh, hopefully is clear that this is a uh, light 
uh, light frame construction, wood light frame construction section. So down here I have uh, the concrete foundation wall. Um, and then I have a plate sitting on top of that. I have a, a two by something, either two by 10 or two by 12. Let's assume that for the joist. Uh, I then have studs up here, which would be either two by fours or two by sixes probably. Um, so let's call that a two by four. Uh, you can't get very much insulation in a two by four, but you get the idea. Um, and at the bottom uh, of that, I have another plate. Um, up top of the two by twelves, I've got the subfloor. And then on the outside of those two by fours, I've got the uh, sheathing. Um, I don't necessarily have to have structural sheathing everywhere, but I'll have it in enough places that uh, by having that sheathing roll all the way by and attaching both to uh, the two by fours and also to this rim joist uh, down uh, at the two by 12 level, uh, that's gonna make it so that my wall doesn't want to just topple off of that floor structure. Uh, that's, so I don't need to have it everywhere. I can use insulating sheathing in some locations, uh, but uh, I'm gonna wanna have some structural sheathing uh, that's gonna tie those things together in order to, to do that. Uh, and then I've got insulation in various spots. Uh, I have drywall in here, some finished floor, a few other things. Uh, so then the question is, what is this element here? So we called it a plate already. Our choices are a sill plate, a sheathing plate, a sole plate, or a base plate. <laughs> so uh, this one down here is actually the sill plate. Uh, I would bet that probably a few people called that the sill plate. Uh, people call it that all the time. Uh, technically though, this one is actually the sole plate. Uh, so the sill plate and the sole plate, um, the sheathing plate is made up. There is no such thing. The base plate we use in steel. Um, between the sill plate and the concrete, I would have a sill sealer, which would be uh, the, well, it, so it would be something that the, the moisture level coming up from the concrete would rot out those sill plates very easily. Uh, even if they were treated over time, uh, they would start to rot out from the amount of moisture that would keep coming from the concrete. So we have to have a little spacer there that gives a little bit of cushioning, but also uh, stops the moisture from getting through. The other thing you would have to do is you'd have a uh, anchor bolt that would be uh, put through that sill plate and into that concrete. Uh, if you get a uh, hurricane or an earthquake or something, that thing's gonna wanna bounce right off if you just add it by gravity. Uh, so the fact that you uh, are mechanically fastening that uh, structural system uh, of the wood uh, into that concrete will help that uh, tremendously. Um, okay, so we just went through a lot of these terminologies. My guess is you'll get one, maybe two questions on light frame uh, construction. In general, it's not, the exam really isn't about this but there is likely to be a couple of spots where you'll see it. The reason it's not about this is because the exam really isn't about uh, residential construction. And while you do light frame construction with some uh, small commercial buildings, uh, it's really more of a kind of residential discussion. Um, so you should know the terms so that you can kind of answer those uh, quick and easy ones, um, but it's not like you're gonna get 40 questions on light frame construction. I think sole plate is a sneaky one. Yeah, no, it's totally annoying. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Hopefully that's not a regional one too, but I've, all the guidebooks I've ever used all talk about it that way. So We're down to two. Um, all right, number eight. The public library is being designed with a concrete waffle slab system. Which of the following is true? A, the drop ceiling is easily at attached to the ribs of the waffle. B, the waffle slab is typically a very economical choice. C, the most complicated aspect will be how to conceal or express the utilities. D, due to all of the ribs, the waffle can be easily adjusted later down the road if the building program alters. So hopefully you know what a waffle slab is. Um, the sort of simple version of it is, uh, if you imagine that you make a giant plywood floor for formwork, uh, holding it up with scaffolding for say the second floor, uh, and then on top of that big bunch of uh, uh, plywood, I put a whole bunch of giant, let's call them Rubbermaid uh, 
bins. So I've got a whole bunch of these things. I place them all right next to each other. Uh, I do that in a nice big grid, these big plastic bins. Uh, so you can imagine they're all a whole bunch of those things and they go on all the way that way and all the way that way. Uh, and uh, once I'm done placing those things all around on top of this plywood, uh, I come back in and pour concrete. Uh, and I pour that concrete so that it fills in all of these spaces in between these big bins uh, going in both directions. Before I did that, I would have put in some very thin little rebar in there. It might be tendons, it might be actual solid rebar, be a few uh, in each. And so suddenly I get this whole waffle of uh, tiny beams that all intersect at 90 degrees to each other uh, over and over again. And I can get uh, pretty long spans and uh, quite a beautiful uh, ceiling because once that thing is set, I come back in, I take down the plywood uh, off of the, from underneath, and then I pop all of these plastic bins out. And what was the airspace that uh, those plastic bins left is now the waffle, and it looks like a waffle iron, hence it's a waffle slab. Uh, and so now I have this very beautiful uh, rhythm of these uh, holes, these square coffers that have been left uh, by uh, the, those bins. Um, I pop them all out, and I effectively have uh, a very structural uh, element. So then I have these uh, very strong waffle ribs uh, as they go along and then in the distance I would see the other one going the other direction um, and a little rebar down uh, down low and then I take that concrete up to a few inches above there so this is all concrete Uh, and it's very strong, very, uh, can go uh, two directions, two directional system, uh, and it's quite beautiful looking. Um, so it's kind of a cool, amazing system, very 60s, very early 70s. Uh, you see a lot of uh, university buildings done in the 70s and, and 60s that, that uh, use this system, very sort of brutal in certain ways, but it kind of a beauty about it. Um, so then, how about A, the drop ceiling is easily attached, so could you uh, drop down little things and have your uh, your drop ceiling down here. Uh, so you've got my little T's and tying those things on. Absolutely, I could do that. Uh, I will have put a drop ceiling on what is one of the most expensive ceilings already. Uh, why would I do that? So A, not going to be the answer because the whole point of doing a waffle slab is that it's a beautiful, beautiful system that is both structurally expressive and uh, is uh, structural and a finish all at the same time. So A doesn't make any sense. Uh, waffle slab is an economical choice. Uh, you have to build it twice. This is the famous thing about doing concrete, right? Um, I have to build it all out of plywood first and then uh, uh, pour the concrete. So it's actually quite expensive. The big advantage is I get multiple use out of it. I get the structural system and the sort of beautiful finish. Um, if you like concrete. Uh, so it's not really considered an economical choice. It's not terribly expensive given that uh, finish. Uh, you don't have to put a, a finish up, but it's not really considered. You wouldn't do it for economical reasons. Uh, C, uh, the most complicated aspect will be how to conceal or express the utilities. Well, that seems kind of interesting, right? If I have uh, uh, somebody standing up here on top of this waffle slab, and this is my finished floor. Uh, my finished floor is the waffle slab. Uh, maybe there's a finish on top of it or, or whatever, but that, that's, that's all there is right there. And I have somebody standing down here looking up, and what they're looking at is that concrete. Well, where does everything go? Where do I put a light fixture? Where do I put the conduit to get to that light fixture? Where do I put the uh, uh, alarm strobe, uh, where does the duct go, right? So you have a tendency on these to have uh, a lot of exposed ducts and to have light fixtures that are put right exactly in the center of those, uh, those spots. In order to do that, when they were pouring that, they probably would have uh, uh, put a conduit inside that concrete, and so they'd have a little, uh, little box uh, right there. But uh, all of that makes it sort of tricky 
potentially quite beautiful but tricky uh, and uh, not something that uh, uh, is easily done. So a complicated aspect is like how you'll conceal and, or at least deal with all of these things is really one of the, the big issues here. So that's really gonna be uh, uh, absolutely true. And then D, uh, due to all the ribs, the waffle can be easily adjusted later down the road uh, if the building program alters. Well, in, in sort of conceptual ways, that's true because it is a two-way system. And so you can actually, uh, you know, the, the structural load can go in multiple directions. But anytime you're cutting a two-way concrete system filled with rebar and uh, the concrete has all of the uh, conduit buried inside it, uh, it's actually notoriously difficult uh, to change down the road. So you'll see, like, uh, if you're going to do an addition to a building uh, on one of these things, you'll often see that they will, uh, you know, put the stairs to the outside or do something in order to not have to cut up these very complicated uh, structural elements. All right. They're gorgeous. Definitely check them out if you haven't spent any time with one. And if you like brutalist stuff. Uh, number nine, when you have a uh, rubble, it's not bubble, right? when you have a <laughs> rubble stone exterior finish with a CMU, concrete masonry unit, backup wall, it is likely that you will use a, a ladder type reinforcing, B, truss type reinforcing, C, adjustable type reinforcing, D, solid barrier type wall system. Um, so when we're talking about reinforcing in a masonry setup, this is even though it's stone, it's considered masonry, um, that uh, in, a, in a sort of typical brick veneer, um, I'm going to have a, a few bricks uh, and then I'll have an air gap. I might have insulation. In fact, I'll, I sure hope I have insulation in there. Um, I have a CMU. So here's my brick out, outer vin, uh, veneer. And here's my uh, inner wythe um, that is the CMU. Uh, so when I do these, I have three of, of uh, those bricks and a typical uh, brick is going to equal one of those CMUs. And so that makes it so that I know uh, that there's going to be these moments where these things align. And the ladder reinforcing just means reinforcing that looks like a ladder. So it's just something like that. A truss reinforcing, well, same basic idea, right? It's like that. And I can lay it right in there. And it's going to reinforce across the two whites, but allow them to be a little bit separate. Uh, so that air gap, um, if one moves a little differently from the other, the metal, uh, th very thin reinforcing uh, will have a little bit of give to it so that it, it can reinforce the wall. Maybe I do it every uh, uh, two CMU courses. Maybe I do it every course. Maybe I do it every three, depending on what the loads are like. Um, but it uh, allows for a little bit of movement. But the question is about a rubble exterior. So rubble is when that stone, you know, might look kind of like uh, something like, like that. I'm just making it up here, right? So, you know, it's all over the place, um, right? In that kind of situation, if I have, if that's the look I have, I'm not likely to have a spot where everything's going to line up all the way across this whole thing. So instead of having these, which can lay flat, I'm going to have uh, these ones that will have, this is in section now, a little bit of uh, element that can sit into the appropriate spot of the uh, CMU. And then it'll have a little piece that can ride up and down this. So if there happens to be a piece of rubble here, uh, and then I can put another one on top of it. And so this can be adjustable up and down to wherever it happens to fit into this system. So it might fit there and there, but then in this one it's going to fit over here, uh, and then this one it's going to be down there. And so I'm able to, by putting these uh, individual pieces in that have this adjustability, I can adjust that reinforcing to fit to uh, the overall. Uh, solid barrier system means I would do it without uh, an air gap. Um, that's also a possibility. 
but uh, I think the adjustable is a better answer. All right, last but not least, number 10. Uh, the slab floor at the big box store has, been, uh, has just been finished and the contractor has just put a giant plastic sheet over the top. Why? Uh, so answer A, worried about curling. B, to protect the troweling. C, allows the finished floor to be added on top. D, uh, keeps the moisture from wicking up from the hydrostatic pressure. Um, so I'm just going to tell you that it's not D, um, that that's not what's going on. It's not, uh, the putting the plastic over is not about hydrostatic pressure. Um, and if I'm in a big box store, my finished floor is almost assuredly the concrete. So it's not C because why would I put a finished floor on the concrete in a big box store? Uh, so the question is, is it about protecting the troweling or protecting uh, or worried about curling? Uh, and the answer is, uh, if I have a big slab and you know, presumably these are fairly wide spaces before you get to the um, control joints uh, or expansion joints. Uh, and I've got you know, ground below, so I've got uh, gravel and, and uh, you know, everything de that's down below it and then air above. Um, and I pour this thing out. Um, maybe it's got a little bit of rebar in there. Uh, what's likely to happen? Well, the part that's exposed to the air is going to dry faster. I'm going to evaporate uh, moisture faster. Uh, and so it's going to start to um, contract compared to the part on the bottom that's going to have a harder time getting rid of its moisture uh, to that ground. Um, now, this isn't always the case because there are situations where the ground is actually very porous and pulls it out. and the humidity level is very high. And so, but in general, when you're talking about the big box stores, the things that they are really worried about is this differential. And so they want it all to uh, go through the uh, 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 heat of hydration, which is the chemical process of the water bonding to the cement, at a continuous level all the way across. Because if the top dries out fast, it's very likely that I'm going to get I'm exaggerating here, but a little bit of curl uh, at those edges. And so that thing is going to curl up. That slab is going to curl up. Now, you might think, really, who cares? It's a big box store. It's got a little bit of tiny curl at the edge. Uh, doesn't really matter that much. Um, you know, why would it even be an issue? Uh, if you're thinking that, you've clearly never worked at a big box store where you might be on a uh, forklift uh, that is 20, 25, 30 feet high, uh, putting those boxes in way, way up at the top. That forklift, I mean, even just a little bit of angle off is going to uh, make that uh, forklift uh, move quite a bit. And I've got some big heavy thing up there uh, and it's going to make that thing uh, fall. So uh, for the big box floors, uh, they really want to get them as smooth as possible. Uh, and so they're going to be very worried about the curling. Uh, and that's why they're going to want to have the uh, moisture stay as even as possible. So the plastic kind of mimics the fact that the bottom uh, is not exposed. And so you're putting the plastic on the top so they're both not exposed. Uh, um, and therefore, it is evenly uh, uh, curing. Uh, so the answer is A. B is also potentially an answer, um, but A is a better answer. Um, so, okay, some of those were easy. Some of those were a little harder. Um, they were all a little obscure, little bits of information. Um, in general, the way the exam is going to work is that there'll be some sort of information that you should know, but that you then have to use it in some way. Right, you have to kind of, you, you know, like understanding the fact of how the concrete uh, is, uh, it's both evaporating water away and it's going through the heat of hydration. So water is being uh, used in that direct moment. Um, sort of understanding that will allow you to start to have like a picture for how that thing is, uh, is changing shape uh, as that uh, project is being done. And then you can start to see it in this sort of design sense, this big floor area. It's not just the fact that uh, this is something that happens to concrete. It's that it's something that happens to people who are trying to work there. 
right? So it's a design issue, it's does it work for the people, uh, and all of them really come down to those kinds of questions. The exam will always be about some specific set of questions, but what they're really getting at is uh, how do you make it better for the client, how do you make it better for the public, how do you make it better for the design. Awesome. So I'm pleased to say we do have one winner here, so looks like John F. Uh, has won um, our free t-shirt contest, I suppose. Way to go, John. So, nice work. Uh, John will be reaching out to you via email here uh, tomorrow uh, to get some information from you. But uh, congratulations. We um, also should do a little quick uh, drawing here. Can you pull up... Um, uh, oh, let's see. I can probably grab it from here. Actually, I can't. <laughs> can you go down to the bottom uh, and pull up uh, the web? Uh, and uh, oh, where is it? Where it is? Sorry. And go to random.org, and we'll pick our winner that way. Any last questions from anybody here before we uh, do this? So uh, one of the questions was, uh, will this be available? Uh, yeah, so we're recording this and we'll make this available um, on our podcast page. It'll probably be available on Friday at some point. Okay. So we're looking for, we need 120 at the bottom. So once you have that. All right, generate, you ready? Yep. Spin the wheel. 103. 103. Who's 103? We're 103 is... Wow, all right. Uh, I'm going with, uh, so first name was J and last name was M. So just <laughs> some characters, interestingly. Uh, looks like Jason produces, perhaps. Uh, that's who it is. So Jason, uh, assuming that that's who you are, um, <laughs> you win. You win, there you go. So we'll be reaching out to you via email. We really do have your email, so that'll work. Um, and we'll send you um, the free uh, Black Spectacles um, Airy plus software learning uh, membership. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and close it up. So thank you, Mike, of course. Thanks to everybody who tuned in and for everyone who tuned in all their, submitted all their questions today. It was pretty awesome. Um, if, uh, if you would like to attend our next ARE live broadcast where we'll feature a recently licensed, actually, we're not gonna do that on this one. Um, as I mentioned, what we're gonna be talking about is ARE 5. Um, and we'll be focusing on uh, exam number four, which is part of the transition. So. Um, Look forward to that. You can go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register to attend. Uh, we will do the, we will feature recently licensed architects probably in October again, so that'll be coming up a little bit later. And just as a spoiler alert, uh, for September, we'll be focusing on the fifth exam for ARE 5 as well. So uh, August, we'll focus on the fourth one, and then um, September the fifth one, those two that are a, a part of the transition. Um, and you know, just like today's episode, for both of those, you'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with Mike for live feedback during the, uh, the live broadcast. And if you'd like to learn more about our ARE exam prep curriculum, you can go to blackspectacles.com uh, where you can learn um, what, we're, what we're doing and um, try out any of the free uh, videos. And for those of you who are ready to start preparing for the ARE, and if you're already an AIA member, you can use coupon code 72016BDCSYT to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your ARE prep membership. And then finally, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think, share any suggestions you may have. I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching.